Hello, welcome everyone to the Computer Science Colloquium. Uh, today, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce six, six speakers from the database group who will tell you about their projects in data management. So in case you haven't noticed this, uh, big data is changing the world today. It helps make scientific discoveries. It helps cars drive themselves. It helps uh, save the environment, and it helps make uh, discoveries in the medical field. Uh, so the students in our group, they conduct research that address the new challenges in big data management. We have a secret sauce, and uh, the secret sauce that exists in databases and data management in general is a separation of the what from the how. What is a declarative level? This is a logic theoretical level where we express how we want the data to be managed and stored and queried. Uh, the how is a physical systems level, algorithmic level, where we, where we uh, design the, the effective methods for storing and managing the big data. So today you will hear uh, six talks from uh, students and postdocs in our group. Uh, the first four talks are more at the, uh, at the border between the what and the how. This is a beautiful stuff where the two extremes are combined. Uh, the last two talks are about the, uh, the what. They, they, they show you the power that we get from a high-level declarative approach to data management. Uh, I should mention that uh, Babak Salimi is, uh, uh, he's going, he presented a video because he's stuck in Canada without a visa. He's waiting for his uh, uh, visa renewal. And uh, also, I would also ask you to um, withhold your questions until the, the end of these talks. So the first talk will be by Brandon Haynes on LightTP. Hey everyone, so I'm Brandon Haynes. Today I'll be talking about uh, LightDB, a data management system that targets virtual, augmented, and mixed reality video applications. This is work in conjunction with Amrita and the Architecture Lab, uh, Armin, who's over at Oculus, along with Magda, Luis, and Alvin, who are all faculty here at CSE. So you might be wondering why I didn't give a talk at the uh, VR session a couple weeks ago. Uh, it's actually not the case that I was kicked out of the graphics lab, but we conceptualize um, these sorts of video applications as being increasingly a data management problem. So we're seeing a lot of really exciting things come out of these communities, um, and they're actually being delivered to real users. So we need to think about things like scaling, uh, being able to work on heterogeneous hardware, and other aspects that the, the, us in the data management community are really good at solving. So there's a whole taxonomy of these sorts of VR and AR style applications out there. You know, this is kind of a, a very rough taxonomy I have on the screen here where we have, um, hopefully you guys are familiar with a couple of these types. I'll just quickly, quickly talk about each one in, in a little bit of detail. So here we have a 360 video. Um, these are videos that are captured at a, at a fixed point in space. And then when you go and view that video, you can of course adjust your orientation, but you can't move away from the point in which that video was captured. And you can see here I'm using the mouse to rotate my orientation, but in you know, the real world we would have a headset on which would have tracking uh, software with it that would adjust our orientation automatically. So these are all over the place and these are pretty widely deployed even on mobile devices and things like that now. But far more exciting are these things called light field uh, videos, a uh, really exciting area uh, at the cutting edge of VR. Um, and here, it's a little bit difficult to tell, but you can, actually, you can actually translate around in space. And so you can see the user just moved outside of the area that was captured in this light field video. Um, modern light field uh, video cameras can capture about a cubic meter of information, uh, which allows for a good amount of uh, translation in space. Um, and this, this greatly increases immersion, as you might imagine. You can do things like experience parallax for distant objects. Uh, mirrors reflect when you move, and you can see the reflection adjust. Iridescent things shine. Super important for immersion and a really exciting area. Um, on the AR, MR side, so here's a prototypical example of a mixed reality video where we mix uh, synthetic video with real world objects like a table or a couch. And then finally, uh, here's, a, here's kind of a hello world augmented reality application where we're in a pet store. We've captured some, uh, some kitten videos. We're running some sort of classifier on top of that video and overlaying bounding boxes. So you may, you may notice this is in fact not an elephant uh, or a dog. Uh, we in the data management community consider that to be the ML people's problem and not <laughs> ours. Um, so you can talk to them about that. So as you might imagine, developing applications in this space is truly terrifying. So 
360 videos are an order of magnitude larger than their 2D Netflix counterpart because you have to deliver that entire sphere of video rather than, you know, just the part that you're looking at. Light field video, another order of magnitude beyond that. That cubic meter uh, uh, of uh, light field camera I mentioned a moment ago puts off about a half terabyte of video data um, uh, per second, which is a formidable challenge to keep up with. This leads to programs that are extremely difficult to program and optimize. They can only be developed by domain experts who are handcrafting optimizations. And perhaps the most concerning thing is that as new innovations roll off the research pipeline, shoehorning them into these giant brittle applications is a substantial software engineering challenge. So with that background in mind, we've introduced a system we call LightDB, a data management platform for these sorts of virtual, augmented, and mixed reality video applications. Uh, LightDB is a, is a uh, full stack data management system where you give um, the system a declarative program. You tell us what you want in your application, and we leave it up to LightDB to figure out an efficient execution plan to realize that, uh, that intent. Um, this leads to programs that are much smaller and simple to ex simpler to express. We'll see an example of that in a moment. And we think it runs faster than um, everything except the most expert programs out there. And so just to motivate this in the couple minutes I have left, um, let's go back to this Hello World augmented reality application and think about how we might develop this. So in today's world, what would we do? Uh, we would open up you know, our favorite editor. We might decide we want to use something like FFmpeg, which is a popular video processing framework. And we start writing some code. And we start writing more code and more code and more code. And this is the reality of these applications today. Um, and this is a minimal viable example we're seeing scroll by here. Um, on the other hand, in LightDB, you'd write something that looks about like this. Well, actually, it looks exactly like that. Um, where it, you know, this is almost a one-to-one -one correspondence between how we might describe solving the problem and solving it, where we decode some inputs from a remote source or from on disk. We apply some sort of detection algorithm on top of it. We union the resulting bounding boxes with the original input video, and then we write it to disk or send it to a client. Very succinct program, um, especially compared to the imperative version. And LightDB is able to actually efficiently execute this. So compared to the version you guys see in the left, you get about a 3x performance benefit relative to, um, to what we can get out of LightDB. And you get all that for free by letting LightDB convert this declarative program into, a, into an optimized execution plan. OK, so how does LightDB perform that conversion? Um, here is kind of a hello world um, virtual reality application I'm going to use to go through that at a very high level. Um, and so here, what we're doing is we're taking a 360 video, overlaying a watermark, converting to grayscale, and then writing to disk. Um, what LightDB does is it converts this into a logical execution plan drawn from its rather modest set of operators. Um, and here, the, you know, there's a there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the, the invocation and the declarative version and the uh, logical plan, but that's not always the case. And it does what you'd expect, decode some input videos, scan the watermark from disk, it's a little bit hard to see there, union them together, transform it to grayscale, and encode it. And now LightDB is going to take this to this uh, logical version and convert and, and explore a space of physical execution plans and hopefully choose the most efficient one. And so here's one potential execution plan it could choose where it moves everything over to a GPU, decodes everything in a GPU, runs some CUDA kernels, and then re-encodes. And that's a reasonable plan. And that, in fact, this is exactly what FFmpeg does. On the other hand, LightDB can explore a much richer space of potential plans, such as this one, which I'm not going to go over in great detail. But the idea here is that um, if this Sharks video has a temporal index associated with it, which is almost universally the case, what we can do is we can take small pieces of that video and shuffle it to multiple GPUs, and then essentially run a similar pipeline in parallel, where we decode, we run a CUDA kernel, and we re encode. On the other hand, the watermark is super tiny. It's the same frame extended over an infinite time span. So what we can do is we can just broadcast that to all the GPUs and bring those things together. In fact, we do that at the top where we concatenate the resulting chunks together. Um, the performance for this, so double the GPUs, we actually get double the performance out of it by, by allowing LightDB to explore this space of plans um, relative to not using the index or using FFmpeg. So I only have a few seconds left. Um, the architecture of LightDB is a rather straightforward data management system. I'm just going to highlight a couple things. So of course we know we have this planner that converts the logical plans to physical execution plans. We know we have an optimizer that draws from a rich set of physical operators uh, that target various hardware, et cetera. Um, and we have a storage manager that I don't have time to talk about today that achieves a considerable uh, compression ratio for stored videos. 
So just to summarize, okay, so this has been LightDB, a data management system for virtual augmented mixed reality videos, smaller declarative programs, free optimization, more efficient execution than the state-of-the-art uh, programs out there. Thanks for listening. The next speaker is Kong Yan. She will tell us uh, why, the net, why the internet is slow and what she can do about this. Thanks for the introduction, Dan. Hi, uh, I'm Kong, and I work with Alvin Chang. So today I'm going to talk about uh, designing data storage, in-memory data storage for web applications. So we use web applications every day. We read news online and uh, work with other people online. But don't you hate them when it takes forever to load like this? So these web applications are slow, not because of the network. The network is usually fast. They are slow because um, they allow the interaction with the database. So the web app usually uses a three-tier architecture. Um, the front end is usually a web browser that um, <coughs> then it issues an HTTP request to the application server, the middle tier. And the, um, the back end is a database that stores the data persistently. Mm, that since the application logic is, always, uh, is often developed using object-oriented language like Python or Java, uh, it often uses an object relational mapping framework, the ORM framework, to generate SQL queries and uh, translate relational data back to objects. We perform 12 open source app web applications. Uh, we profile 12 open source applications to see how well they perform. So these applications are popular with many GitHub stars. Some of them are pretty well known, like GitLab and OpenStreetMap. So for these applications, even with a small amount of data, less than one gigabyte, over three pages takes more than two seconds to load. And for these slow pages, they spend over 80% on the application server, especially the ORM framework and also the backend database. Then we look into why this, uh, why this is slow. So there are two major causes. The first is how the queries are written. Um, because these ORM frameworks usually provide similar APIs with very different performance. For example, here, this is a foreign application developed using Ruby on Rails. It wants to show a list of certain stories and then calculates the count of these stories. So it first issues a SQL query to retrieve these stories and then store them in this variable S. Then if the application writes S.size, um, the count of the stories is computed using in-memory objects. However, if the application writes S.count, uh, it performs the same thing, but the count is done by issuing a count query to the database. So these two APIs um, have the same functionality, but the count is less efficient than size because of this extra query issued. So these APIs are usually very confusing and result in inefficient queries. The second reason is how the data is stored. For example, the, if the app wants to show a list of users and each containing is a stories. So um, to answer this query, um, the backend stores two tables, the, story, uh, the user table and the story table. To answer this query, it first performs a join on these two tables and then converts this relational result into nested objects. So if there are a large number of users and stories, um, both the join and the deserialization can be very slow. So if we can pre-compute and store this join result in memory, we save the time to do the join. And further, if we can store this nested object directly, we save the time to deserialize. However, these nested objects may not be optimal for all the queries in the application. For example, a query that selects the stories. So it is challenging to figure out the best storage model for the whole application. To solve this challenge, we built Chestnut, an in-memory storage designer to optimize the overall query performance subject to a memory bound. Instead of the low-level inefficient interaction used by today's ORM, Chestnut proposed a new language this declarative language is designed to cleanly and easily express common object queries. 
um, the query result are directly objects instead of relational data. Even better, this language can be used to optimize. It can be used to leverage, to customize in-memory storage. And um, the interaction with the database is more efficient because the read queries can be answered using this in-memory storage, while only the write queries go to the backend database. This optimization is challenging because you need to design a new search space and a new search algorithm. Chestnut proposed a new search space that includes, um, that explores both relational and non-relational storage options. So it considers um, denormalize the table and the index indexes in the relational world and the nested objects and the pointers in the non-relational world. It devises a new search algorithm that uses bounded verification to find out the storage for each individual query and then uh, formulates into the ILP to find out the sharing of data structures among queries. To use Chestnut, um, developer simply needs to provide classes and uh, queries declared using Chestnut language, as, as well as the memory bound. And Chestnut will generate C++ code uh, for both the storage and the queries. Uh, we evaluated Chestnut on three open source applications originally built with Ruby on Rails and used MySQL at the back end. These applications include Kandan, a heap chat like chatting application, Redmine, a GitHub like project management application, and the Lobsters, a hacker news like foreign application. For these three applications, this figure shows the average time of these applications. Um, the, uh, the query time is composed of the time to retrieve the data for the query and the time to deserialize that data into Ruby objects. So as we can see from this figure, Chestnut is able to speed up the query up to 26x. And uh, it, it, it's faster in both the query answering and the deserialization. And for all of these applications, it takes less than an hour to find out the best storage. Next, we'll, I'll show an example of what data structures Chestnut is able to find for an individual query. So this is a query that shows a list of tags and then counts the uh, number of stories written by a particular user for each tag. To answer this query, the original application needs to join three tables. The tag table, the mapping table that says which story has which tag, and then the story table and then it performs an aggregation and uh, um, performs a group and then an aggregation. It takes 0.8 seconds to finish this query. Instead, Chestnut stores only the active tags and uh, uh, in, in, inside each tag, it stores the user ID and then the story count of that user. So to answer this query, it only needs to scan the tags and then do a binary search on the story ID to figure out the, um, the story count. And it only takes seven milliseconds to finish. So to conclude, we show that many web applications has performance issue due to the mismatch between object and the relational data model. So we built Chestnut, an in-memory storage designer. Chestnut has a new declarative language and uses a new search algorithm to explore both relational and non-relational storage options, and it is able to significantly improve the query performance. Thanks. Thank you, Kong. Uh, the next speaker is Maz Ahmad. He will tell us how to generate automatically very difficult programs on distributed data. Thank you, Dan. Um, hi, everyone. So I'm Maz. I also work with Elwin. Um, and the problem that I want to talk about today is basically the high-level problem that we want to fix is that we have all these new data processing frameworks and DSLs being developed for new hardware or new abstractions, and we want, to be, we want people to be able to update or adapt these systems more easily. In specific, I'm going to be talking about Casper, which is a tool for generating MapReduce applications from sequential Java uh, implementations. So the first question is, why do we even want to trans do this sort of translation? So imagine if you have a sequential application or legacy application that exists, and you use this application to do some data processing, maybe build some visualizations. Now, as the amount of data increases, that application might become too slow or might stop working. Of course, you can scale your application by running it in a parallel and distributed setting. The good news is the database community has built a lot of tools that can 
you know, run your applications in this distributed setting. The problem is, for your sequential application to leverage these optimizations, it must be rewritten using the framework's provided API. So in order to use these frameworks, you then have to rewrite your applications. The first option, of course, is that you could manually sit down and rewrite all of your code. This is, of course, time-consuming. It's tedious. It requires expertise not only to understand the input code, but also the target frameworks that you want to use. And, of course, you could introduce bugs into your system when you do this sort of translation. So what we want to do is we want to just completely automate this process by building a compiler that does this uh, translation for you. Why is it difficult to build compilers in this manner? So traditionally, whenever we're building compilers, we use syntax directed rules. What this means is the compiler will scan the input code looking for code patterns. For example, here's a code pattern that it might look for. And every time it finds a code pattern that is syntactically matches this, uh, you know, this, uh, uh, a code pattern that matches uh, syntactically this pattern that you have, it will just simply rewrite it using some operators from the target language. So for example, in Spark, it will use filter and the union operators. For code fragments that are th that simple, it's easy. However, as the, as the data processing algorithms get really, really large and they get more complex, the set of rules that you need to do the translation become unobvious. And in fact, reasoning about these rules become, becomes almost impossible. So the reason we believe it's hard to use rewrite rules to do this translation is that the code that you want to generate, the specifications for that code are provided to you in terms of legacy code, which is written in low level, messy languages that are very complex. What if, instead of the specifications were provided in this low-level language, what if they were provided in a cleaner, high-level, simpler language? For example, if the specification for the programs was provided in a functional language that just had map and reduce of primitives. Now, generating the Spark code or Hadoop or Flink code from this specification is much, much easier. However, we don't have the specification in that cleaner form, so essentially what we need is a way to convert the legacy programs and extract the specifications out of them. And the way we want to do this is by using program synthesis. So a quick primer on what program synthesis is. So if you have some piece of code and you want to use program synthesis to do the translation, the idea is to consider the space of all possible MapReduce programs. So say this shape represents all possible programs uh, or specifications that you can write using MapReduce primitives. And within this space, maybe there's a few uh, programs that actually produce the same outputs given the same inputs for all inputs. In program synthesis, we simply search for these, uh, for these programs that have the same outputs. If we can find these programs, and if we can verify that for all inputs they produce the same output, we can essentially treat those programs as a translation of the input code. So the big question with this sort of approach is, how can we make this scale? Of course, the size of the search space that you're considering is extremely large, so how can you actually uh, do this in a reasonable amount of time? So I'm just going to show some quick high-level ideas for how you might make the search manageable. The first and probably the most important idea is to design very carefully an API for expressing the specifications. Since we're doing the search, you can imagine doing the search directly in the target uh, frameworks API. So for example, if you want to generate Spark code, you could synthesize the program or search for the program written in that API. However, those APIs were not designed with synthesis in mind. So for example, Spark has over 80 high-level operators, and searching in them is very expensive. In this instance, for example, we were able to design an API that could capture the same semantics using only three operators, and that reduces the search space significantly. Secondly, you want to use some prog uh, static program analysis. What essentially this means is you look at the program code uh, automatically and you try to generate heuristics about it. So you might specialize the search by saying that you know, if the input type of the program is a list of integers, you don't want to consider any MapReduce program that operates on a different type. Similarly, you might want to specialize the search or like bias a search by saying that only search for programs or search for those programs first that use the same operators like addition. Third, you can use incremental search. And the idea here is to instead of searching for the entire space at the same time, you break the space down and you search incrementally. And this becomes really powerful when you introduce cost-based pruning. And the idea here is that you order these subspaces by their, the cost of the programs that they generate so you can then search for you know, more efficient programs first, and if you can find one of those, you can just prune away the rest of the search space. So this idea or this technique that I've explained so far, we actually implemented this in a tool called Casper. Uh, Casper takes as input unannotated Java sequential code and generates and is able to generate code in three MapReduce frameworks, Spark, Hadoop, and Flink. 
for evaluation, we, we you know, accumulated a bunch of uh, benchmarks, about 55, from prior works and open source implementations of different algorithms. These include you know, common statistical and you know, mathematical functions, as well as big data uh, workloads that are popular. Within these 55 benchmarks, about 100 code fragments were found that were doing data processing. And from those 100, about 82, Casper was able to translate completely automatically. Um, the ones that failed were either because it was taking too long to search or because the API that we had was not expressive enough. So the first evaluation that we did was, of course, to compare with a rule-based compiler. This is a prior work, uh, a compiler called Mold. On the x-axis, you can see uh, a subset of the benchmarks that we've picked. And on the y-axis, you see the improvement after compiling the uh, code using Casper or the Mold compiler. The first thing you'll notice is that Casper, which is in yellow, can translate way more benchmarks than the rule-based compiler can. This is not very surprising. Um, what's more interesting is that even for the benchmarks that Mold can compile, Casper finds more efficient implementations. However, the ultimate sort of benchmark that we want to test is against a human. So how does Casper compare against a human? We hired online uh, developers through a freelancing platform. We had them manually rewrite these applications, and then we compared the performance of the handwritten implementations versus what we generated. As you can see, in most cases, the performance was extremely competitive. There were a few cases like the 3D histogram where the user or the manual developer exploited some domain-specific knowledge to optimize the program better than what Casper could do. It takes Casper about 10 minutes to, on average to uh, translate one code fragment, and uh, the median time is even lower. So for really simple programs, it can actually uh, translate them really, really fast. And this does not count any of the overhead involved in hiring these developers and you know, making sure that they do the work on time. So the key takeaways are you can actually use compilers to do this sort of high-level uh, transformations. And with a speed of about 16x, Casper is even competitive with handwritten translations. Um, so here's a link. If you want to read the paper, use the demo. Um, I'll take your questions at the end. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Matt. Uh, the next speaker is Jennifer Ortiz. She looks at a very difficult question, how to convert from the, how to, from the what to how using deep learning. Thanks, Dan. Um, so today I'll be presenting a project called Deep Query, where we're learning subquery representations for query optimization. And this is joint work with my advisor, Magda Belandinska, Johannes Gerke, and Sathya Kirthi. So generally, whenever we have questions about our data, we rely on a database systems to help answer these questions. And these systems help us store, maintain, and manage our data. But these database systems are generally constrained by allocated resources. And with this limitation, the database system must come up with, with what we call an optimal query plan. And you can think of this op query plan as essentially a program that is able to efficiently uh, fetch data, run computations on the data before providing the final result. So just as a quick example, say we have, for example, three relations, the customers, orders, and regions table. We have this query where we say, uh, we want to fetch all the customers from Arizona that have orders within the last 10 years. Now, to run this type of query, we would need to join across all of these three relations. And when the optimizer looks at this query plan, it needs to consider, well, in what order should I actually be running this join? For example, we can first join the customers and orders table, which will get us some intermediate result, and follow that with a join with the regions table. Or we could first join the customers and regions table, which can give us a smaller intermediate result, and then follow that with a join with the orders table. As you can imagine, depending on your query or the number of relations that you have in your data set, you can have really complex query plans, which makes it even harder for the optimizer to come up with an efficient plan. And essentially, the idea of query optimization has been a core problem in the database community for several years. And this is especially hard because these optimizers have to come up with these good plans with really limited understanding about the underlying data. And these plans need to be efficient with respect to the resource consumption and also the runtime. And essentially, this problem essentially boils down to what we call the cardinality estimation problem. Where cardinality estimation is the process of estimating the number of rows that are returned by a query. And this is essential for producing these optimal join orders. And unfortunately, because the optimizer needs to be efficient, it makes really simplifying assumptions about the data. 
So for example, if we have this query where we're joining across all these three relations and we're filtering the customers and regions table, it might make some assumptions about the correlations of these columns in these, in these relations, which results in some uh, inaccurate cardinality estimation for some of the intermediate results, which then provides us with a suboptimal query plan. So there must be some other approach that we can use to solve this problem. So I likely don't need to motivate why deep learning has been useful, um, but we've seen how it's been successful in various applications such as image processing and also natural language processing. So in this work in particular, we want to look at, well, what can deep learning do, but in the context of uh, data management? So our vision in this work is to say, can we rethink about query optimization, but in the context of deep learning? So say we have as input some data set and some query that we want to run, can we use a model to uh, describe different properties of the query? For example, can we have the model give us an optimal query plan, describe the resource consumption of the query, or estimate the query's cardinality? Now, for, as a first step in this project, we're just focusing on estimating the cardinality of the query. And one thing that we want to consider is, well, how do we encode our inputs? How can we encode the data and the query? So for these models, essentially, the input is, is this, you can think of it as a long vector where we can encode information about our inputs. In this case, we have our data and our query. One approach to encode the data would be to provide the model with really basic statistics about the data. For example, we can provide the model with simple one-dimensional histograms across some of the columns that exist in our data. And now for the query, one way we can encode this would be to provide the model with all possible, uh, some possible joint predicates or possible uh, selections that could exist on this data set. Now the problem with this approach is that these vectors need to be really long to encode all possible queries that we could write on this data set. So essentially what we need is a model that will give us this ability to encode all possible queries that we can run on this data. So the intuition behind our approach is to instead view this query plan as a sequence of operations. So for example, we can first uh, filter the customer's relation, fo followed by a filter with the region, and then combine this to do a join, and so on. And we can iterate through all the operations until we've completed the query plan. So essentially what we want to do is to learn what we call the subquery representations where we still want to use deep learning, but we want to use it to describe specific properties of these intermediate results. So just as a really quick example, say we have this query where we're joining tables A and B, and we have two operations. We have a join and a selection. So the idea is that we can start with an encoding that, that shows a, uh, basically a representation over our data set and, a, in, and one of the operations, in this case, a selection. Now, given these inputs, we can use a deep learning model to come up with a representation of the following uh, intermediate result. So in this case, we applied a filter, and now we have some encoding of the subquery. Now, from this representation, we can extract information such as the distribution of the data at that subquery or even the cardinality. Now, given this representation, we can chain another operation, in this case a join, and still use our deep learning function to come up with a subsequent uh, uh, sub representation of that subquery. So essentially what we're learning is this rec recursive function that takes as input some encoding or some subquery representation along with a query operation to come up with a representation of the following result. So just to give you a sense of what these models can do, um, we wanted to experiment and see how well these models are able to estimate the cardinalities compared to a commercial database engine. Um, and for these experiments, we use the IMDB dataset, which has some interesting correlations across these columns. So here, for example, in this graph, we're showing the percentage error in terms of cardinality on the y-axis, and on the x-axis, we're showing the database system compared to the neural network. Um, for these queries, we only uh, vary the uh, selection predicate for one of the columns on one of the relations. So you can see that the database system generally does pretty well, but our neural network is able to get slightly more accurate cardinality estimation results. 
Now, if we make this problem a little bit harder, where we're now selecting across several more of these columns, in this case, we actually need to have the model learn about the distribution and correlations ac for, across these columns. It's harder for, our, uh, for the network and also for the database system. Um, but in the cases now where we're starting to chain more of these representations together, for example, in this case, we are um, applying selections on two different tables and also tying that with a join, it becomes a lot harder for the system and also for the network itself. So what we're experimenting now is thinking about what it actually means to, uh, to or actually to improve these results, we want to see what it means to chain and tie these representations together um, along with these complex query operations. So just to conclude, we've talked about why cardinality estimation is a difficult problem and how we should start looking at other new approaches. And so in this, in this work, we propose this model of learning these subquery representations through a recursive function by using one of the deep learning networks. Thanks, Jennifer. So then the next talk is by uh, Babak Salimi. Uh, he is um, in Vancouver. Uh, he's waiting for his visa. He sent us a, a video uh, of his talk. He also has a cool demo. It's about uh, how to understand when your queries are not returning what you think you're, you are returning and how to fix them. Hi, everyone. I'm Babak. Uh, today, I'll be talking about bias in the context of decision support SQL queries. Decision support SQL queries are used today by knowledge workers to make better and faster decisions. However, inexperienced workers can easily write SQL queries that are biased for decision making, unless they are trained as statisticians, which is typically not the case. As we will see throughout this talk, biased SQL queries can lead to wrong business decisions. Let's go through a motivating example. Suppose a company has many business travels from four particular airports and would like to choose between business travel programs offered by either American or United Airline, depending on which one has a better performance in terms of on-time flight. To find out, the knowledge worker does some simple data analysis and writes a SQL query that computes the average delay once for American and once for United Airline. The bar diagram on the left shows the result of this query. You may acknowledge that the scenario is repeated over and over in industry today. Users write declarative queries, explore the results, and make decisions based on the insights obtained from these results. In our example, the knowledge worker looks at the bar and observes that American looks significantly better, so she decides to contract with American. However, any trained statisticians would recognize that to make decisions regarding the performance of the two airlines, one need to look into potential confounding factors such as how frequently these airlines operate at different airports, simply because one airline may have several flights from an airport which has a high rate of weather-related flight delays. This clearly makes the comparison between the two airlines with that SQL query biased and unfair. This is actually the case in our example. Once we break down the delay by each airport, it turns out that in each of the airports, it is actually United Airlines that has a better performance. This trend reversal is known as Simpson's paradox in statistics and happens because of overlooking the confounding variables. In this case, what the company really wants is the causal effect of choosing American or United Airlines on the delay of its travelers. But the simple SQL query fails to answer that question because it is biased. Similar to the other project that we have seen in this talk so far, we leverage the declarative nature of SQL and perform this complex causal analysis automatically on top of the structure of the query. Specifically, we propose HipDB, the first database system which detects, explains, and removes bias from SQL queries. Instead of discussing the technical contribution, I will demonstrate HipDB with two examples. Okay, so HipDB accepts as input uh, a SQL group by query and assumes that the query is being used for making decisions. Here, uh, with the simple group by query, uh, the goal is to find out uh, the effect of choosing one of the two carriers or airlines on flight delays. As we have discussed, the answers to this naive query, they suggest that American airline performs significantly better. However, HeapDB takes advantage of the declarative nature, nature of SQL and performs some deep analysis on the SQL query and automatically detects confounding fact factors uh, that are detected today only by trained statisticians. Uh, these confounding factors make the query biased for decision making. Uh, 
Specifically, first, CPTB warns the user that further grouping by some of the confounding factors would radically change the insight obtained by the original SQL query. As you see in this case, uh, HipDB automatically identified origin airport as a confounding factor such that further grouping by origin uh, totally reverses the train obtained by the original uh, query. Uh, the next step is to remove the bias from query. HipDB does this by rewriting the query to control for the confounding uh, variables. The query shown right here in this box um, is the rewritten query associated to the group by query we started uh, with. Uh, please to pre refer to the paper for more details about uh, this query rewriting, but uh, for the moment note that under certain assumptions, the insight obtained from the answer to this rewritten query are unbiased and support decision making. The bar diagram uh, here uh, shows the answers to the rewritten query right here on the left. Uh, the answers uh, reveal that it is actually United Airlines which performs better than American Airlines. So there is no Simpsons paradox anymore. Finally, uh, HipDB generates two kinds of explanations for the, for the bias query. We argue that these explanations are crucial for decision making and reveal illuminating insight about the domain and the data collection process. HipDB generates coarse grain explanations by ranking the detected confounding factors in terms of their responsibility for making the bias for making the query bias. In this case, as you observe here, uh, origin airport has the highest responsibility. The fine grain explanation generated by HipDB is essentially a ranking sy system which drills down into uh, a particular confounding factor and explain how the interaction of the ground levels of the attributes involved in a SQL query contribute to the bias. In this case, uh, the top four uh, fine grain explanations for origin airport indicate that uh, United Airlines frequently flies from airports such as Rochester Airport uh, that has a lot of weather related uh, flight delay whereas American Airlines frequently flies uh, from airports such as McAllen Miller that has fewer delay. And this is this simply explains why the initial SQL query that we started with was biased toward American Airlines. Okay, for the second example, I'm going to use the famous adult income data set from the UCI machine learning repository. Actually using this data set, several prior works on discrimination, discovery, and fairness have reported gender discrimination in favor of males. To replicate these experiments, let's use HipDB to compute the effect of gender on income with this simple group by query, which essentially compute the average of males and females uh, with uh, high income. As you see right here, uh, the results of this SQL query uh, indeed suggest a strong disparity with respect to females' income. Um, however, not surprisingly, HipDB detects that this query is biased uh, and it identifies attributes such as marital status as confounding variables. To remove the bias from the initial SQL query, HipDB rewrites the query to uh, control for the confounding variables. Here uh, you see uh, the rewritten query associated with the naive one that we started with. Uh, in this bar diagram, you see the answers to this root and query. As you observed, um, the root and query answers, they suggest that the disparity between males and female, females um, is not nearly as drastic as suggested by uh, the naive SQL qu uh, query. Um, to, uh, to see what's going on here, let's check out the explanations generated by HipDB. The coarse-grained explanation, um, they show that marital status account for the most of bias, uh, followed by occupation. Uh, let's uh, take a deeper uh, look into marital status and see why it makes the query bias. The top four fine-grained explanations reveal a surprising fact. They say there are more married males in adult data than married females, and marriage has a strong positive association with high income. Uh, to understand why this is uh, actually the case in adult data, we check the provenance of this data set, and it turns out that the adult, uh, the, the income attribute in adult data, it reports the adjusted gross income as indicated in individuals' tax forms, which depends on filing a status. It could be actually household income. 
therefore, adult data is essentially inconsistent and should not be used for investigating gender discrimination. Uh, with this, I will uh, conclude. We have shown that SQL queries can be biased and misleading. We propose HipDB, a, a system to detect, explain, or resolve bias from SQL queries. We've shown that HipDB is useful for making causal analysis accessible for non-statisticians, avoiding false discoveries, and detecting errors in data collection. Thank you for listening, and I hope to see you soon in Seattle. Let's thank Babak. Uh, he's, he's online watching, uh, and he can take questions at the end. The last talk is by Shumo Chu, who is uh, going to tell us how to check if two query, SQL queries are equivalent, a, a fundamental task in query optimization. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Shumo, and uh, today I'm going to talk, talk about automated reasoning of database queries. And this is joint work with uh, a few folks from a database group and a PL group. So first, I will show you a figure. Right? So this is a survey by Stack Overflow shows uh, language popularity. Right? It actually tells you JavaScript is the best programming language in the world, while SQL is the second. And sorry, Facebook, PHP is like far behind. Right? So, for, like, uh, talking about the actual stuff, I mean, SQL is really a, a popular language that's supported by all the relational database systems and now supported by almost all the uh, big data systems. Well, why SQL is great? Because this is actually a restricted abstraction enabling powerful optimizations. While the database community spent almost like more than 30 years uh, to develop many powerful optimizations, well, based on the semantic equivalence of, of SQL rewrites. The problem here is that we are really lacking tools that can actually reason about SQL equivalence. So here I will use a, a self-driving car analogy. Well, it's really embarrassing that we have self-driving car right now. We don't have an automated solver for SQL. And what is an automated solver for SQL? Uh, it means that for any possible input, can we actually check whether those two SQL queries are semantic equivalent? And this is, has many uh, ap applications. For example, it can be used to verify the correctness of a query rewrite to make your query optimizer more reliable. It can also be used to build a semantic caching layer for big data systems. And what's more, it can be used for automatic grading of SQL assignment to scale the MOOC. Well, apparently this is a very challenging problem. First, uh, like from a theoretical result 50 years ago, uh, deciding these two, uh, two relational queries are equivalent are actually undecidable. Uh, in addition, if you think about SQL, you might think just uh, select from where, uh, but actually SQL has uh, rich language features, right? So you have uh, aggregation and grouping, uh, you have an uh, index and uh, integrated constraint, and you can write like correlated subqueries like exist. So how can we solve this problem? Well, we have two lights we can shed on, right? So from a, from a Gerdas result, well, a problem is undecidable. It doesn't mean there is no, no proof. And in fact, so you can use an interactive serum prover that you can use it to uh, validate, mechanize proofs. And second thing, second observation we can find is that the model of uh, inequivalent SQL queries are usually very large. And in fact, this is known to the formal method community. And this partially explains why the constraint solver nowadays are extremely fast. Right? So we can use constraint solver to model checking SQL. So based on these two observations, so we build COSET, the first automated solver for SQL by combining interactive theorem proving and constraint solving. Uh, well, it takes me like uh, almost three years to build this tool. Uh, it can be concluding this uh, simple slides, right? So for a given pair of SQL queries, uh, we did two things. First, we compiled the SQL queries to uh, propositions that can be checked by the theorem, uh, interactive theorem prover. And then we developed a proof search or automated proof generation procedure inside of the theorem prover to try to find uh, mechanized proof for these uh, equivalences. And secondly, we compile these SQL queries to constraint solver and use a and build a model checker to check 
uh, in order to find the counterexamples uh, to invent these SQL queries. Well, uh, without actually showing the code, I will actually show you a demo. Uh, so this is, a, this is a tool that we built for checking equivalence of SQL queries. So you can see, you can specify a schema and uh, specify the table. And then you uh, basically write two SQL queries. Well, you can see the first SQL query uh, joins the uh, employee and payroll uh, using the uh, employee ID. Well, the second query here, we do kind of a similar stuff, but there is another join, and there, there is two like em employee table, right? So, I mean, I know it's really tricky to say whether, to, it's really tricky to uh, reason about whether it's equivalent. So that's why we need our tool. Well, the solving takes some time, but this is really the uh, formal method researcher's part. Um, <laughs> so you can see that uh, uh, these two SQL queries are indeed equivalent. Well, it's hard to, it's hard to explain exactly why, but intuitive, intuitively is that uh, the, there is a join in the second query is kind of redundant, right? So let's show you another example. So uh, in this example, similarly, you can see there are two SQL queries. They're kind of like a super elastic because there is a join, there is group by, and there is a subqueries, right? So whether these two SQL queries are equivalent? Well, it actually not, and returns a counterexample. If you actually run these two SQL queries using this counterexample, you will find exactly why. But to give you a short story, this is actually, uh, people actually saw these two SQL query equivalent. And they published a paper in the top database journal in, uh, 90, uh, in, in 1982. And after three years, people find this is actually incorrect. And of course, they published another paper to say this is incorrect. Uh, but the high level idea is that uh, the second query actually ignores the extremely color case that when the group by when the, uh, when, when the group is empty, right? So it takes three years for the database researcher to find this bug, while it takes our tool, well, less than 10 seconds. Uh, to conclude, um, I, I show you that SQL is the uh, best programming language like to JavaScript, and uh, we built Cosette, the first practical SQL solver, uh, like based on the integration of interactive theorem proving and constraint solving techniques. And I would say uh, automated reasoning brought by the integration of formal methods and domain-specific semantics will lead to more reliable and more optimized future database systems. Okay, so let's, uh, let's thank Shumo. And I would like to ask uh, all the five speakers to come to, uh, to the front, uh, and we have like two minutes for questions. So any questions? Yes, please. You mentioned that uh, only writes end up having to go to the database uh, for a web application. Um, I know some web applications, I don't know, multiple people may be uh, writing it at once. Is there some easy, some easy mechanism for, for knowing when you know, somebody else has done something, or is that sort of out of scope here? Uh, yeah, so basically the write query both updates the in-memory storage and the backend database. So the backend database has a lot of mechanisms to hand, handle concurrent write, basically using transactions. And similarly, like in our model, even though I haven't implemented it yet, but um, yeah, we can use similar algorithm to use in-memory transaction processing to make sure the update on the older data structures, they are atomic. So when different people are doing different writes on different data structures, I make sure that there are no interleaving of them. Yes, one more. Uh, I have a question for Brendan. So um, uh, you have, like, there's this, you were talking about all these new, like, methods for capturing video in different ways, <coughs> like C or cubes. And I was wondering, um, are the, like, standards for how to store, like, the exact file formats, I mean, are they standardized at this point? Are they changing? Is your tool, like, designed to change with, like, different file formats? Or is it, is it pretty specific to, like, one type? Right, so that's a really good question. So um, for anyone who didn't hear, so 
um, the comment was that there's many, many formats and projections and all sorts of different VR and AR things out there. There's a giant zoo, and um, is, are, there, are there standards, or how quickly is that changing, and how do we handle that? And so, so and when you run a SQL query, you don't think about whether your relation is stored as a B tree or as a heap or a flat file. You let the database engine figure out how to manage it. Um, and so we do the same thing in LightDB. So there's, there is, as you suggested, a very large set of formats and video codecs and, for, and, and 360 videos versus live fields and all sorts of, of ways to store these data. And they're constantly evolving. Um, and some are more efficient for some types of queries than others. And we do our best. Um, a, to abstract that so the user doesn't have to ever have to think about it, so you don't worry about whether your video is H.264 encoded. You just load it from the catalog. And we'll actually make modifications as necessary to minimize the storage footprint if you store it later on. And um, if you run subsequent queries, it may run faster with those conversions. So we try to pay attention to that. I mean, of course, we don't at this time cover every possible video codec, for example. But the idea is that we could extend that to support whatever's out there if there's a user demand for it. It's a really good question. Okay, so I think this is all the time we have. So let's let's thank the speakers again, and thank thanks everyone for coming.